everybody. How's everybody doing today? All right. Are we ready to get fired up for Jesus today? Yeah. Amen. I, just being in the presence of God is, is amazing. And I just want to start off today with prayer. And I want to start off with a prayer. You all know how I feel about praying scripture, how powerful it is. And uh, God led me to pray this one verse in Philemon verse 6 and it is Paul wrote this letter to Philemon but I'm telling you it applies to us today and, I, and, and this is my prayer for the church today that, that what happens here to well, just one of the things that happens and I just want to read verse 6 and then then open up in prayer and I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. Father God, we thank you. We praise you, Lord Jesus. And, and Lord, we just ask you today, Lord, Lord, we, we cry out for your presence here today, Lord. Lord, you are welcome here. And we just ask you to move, let your Holy Spirit roam throughout this place, Lord. That you would just revive our souls, Lord. That you would just touch our hearts, Lord. And, and, and clear our minds, Lord, and, and so we can focus and think on you, Lord. Lord, just pray that you take all the distractions away, uh, the cares of this world that are, some of us have walked in very heavy with some heavy concerns and heavy prayer requests. Lord, I pray that you just help us to take this time to just join you in your presence and, and just allow you to minister to us today, Lord. Lord, I pray that you use us to, to just touch hearts and just change lives, Lord. Lord, ultimately today, the prayer is that people here today, if there's anyone here today that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, that today would be the day of salvation. And for those of us who know you, Lord, that we would just be drawn back to you. And Lord Jesus, I just pray that you just do a mighty work. Lord, we just want to thank you for... Um, just bringing Frank here with us today and Lord just pray that you just anoint him with the power of your Holy Spirit and Lord Jesus that you would move and do what only you can do Lord we pray all this in Jesus most precious and holy name amen okay today we're going to be doing something a lot different it's not going to look like our regular service as I've been telling you it's going to be unlike any service we've ever done on Sunday and of course the Holy Spirit is going to move and I want to give you a, a scripture that I know you're all familiar with to start off with, and that's Psalm 51. And you can either open your Bibles or you can read it on the screen. But just listen to this. Have mercy on me, O God. How many need mercy from God today here? I know I do. We need, we need his mercy. And the thing is, his tender mercies are new every morning. Every morning we get up and we have his tender mercies. According to your steadfast love, and his love, this love that we're talking about here, steadfast, his love is never changing, and it's perfect. His love is perfect, and it casts out all the fears that you have right now in your heart right now. His perfect love is the only thing capable of taking all that fear away because it's steadfast. His love is never going to change. It's, he's immovable. That's our God. He's immovable. His love is, 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 is amazing. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. I want you to remember the day that you came to Jesus Christ and every sin that you ever committed was taken away. Was that an awesome time, an awesome day in your life? That we revisit the cross and realize that because of Jesus, we are forgiven. And, and, and he blotted out all my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. We need to pray that Jesus would wash us clean. And he washes us clean with blood. His blood keeps us clean. Amen? Yes. And cleanse me from my sin. Cleanse me from my sin. That, my dear... <laughs> is repentance we got to return and, and and repent from our sin to be cleansed from from the sin for i know my transgressions the holy spirit will let you know your transgressions amen the holy spirit will let you know you can fool maybe we might be able to fool each other but we're not going to fool god amen 
and my sin is ever before me against you you only have I sinned. think about that when we sin our sin is against Jesus against God yes and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment behold I was brought forth in iniquity and my sin in sin did my mother conceive me behold your delight you delight in truth and in the inward being and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart how many need to be taught wisdom today in the secret heart yes and, and that's a prayer that we should pray every day for his wisdom we need his wisdom I'll tell you because this world doesn't have a whole lot of wisdom does it purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean wash me and I shall be whiter than snow let my let me hear joy of gladness let the bones that you have broken rejoice hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities and here's what we need church create in me a clean heart oh god there's nothing sweeter than going to bed at night having a clean heart and, and again that cleansing we know comes from god and only god and renew a right spirit within me some of us here today do not have the right spirit we don't have the right spirit we need to have the holy spirit power and living in that power church stop quenching the spirit and allow the holy spirit to have full rule and reign in your life man there's so much power in the holy spirit that's residing you the same holy spirit that raised jesus christ from the dead lives in you and me how much more powerful can it get than that so don't look at yourself as a victim look at yourself in victory in jesus amen, amen. Yeah. all right Cast me not away from your presence. I don't want to ever live another moment in my life outside of the presence of God. Man, I'm telling you, there is nothing sweeter, nothing more brings more joy than being in the presence of Almighty God. And, and, and I just want to tell you that we, He never leaves us. It's us that leaves Him. When He, he told us He would never leave us nor forsake us. So... We're the ones that have walked away. If you're not feeling the presence of God, it's because you moved, not God. Because he, again, is immovable. And take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. I don't know about you, but when I came to know Jesus, Lord Christ, I wanted the world to know that I had just found the Savior because he Gave, he, 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 came, he, he gave me his Holy Spirit as Jesus promised and he changed me from the inside out and I, and I ne will never be the same because of Jesus and because of the Holy Spirit that resides and lives in me. Re okay, I'm just, and uphold me with a willing spirit. And when we do all this church, I, I, this verse is the one that really uh, banged me between the eyes as I was reading this, verse 13. After all this, after what we just, just talked about, then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. In other words, church, we need to cleanse ourselves to be able to give people the holy God because they have to see Jesus in us. They have to see the fact that we are different. We are peculiar, that we... We're not no better than anybody. We're just forgiven by the blood of Jesus. And with that forgiveness, and when, and we, when we create, when our heart's clean and when we're coming before God for cleansing, we will have a desire to teach people your, His ways. And that's what we're called to do as a, as a church and as a, as a body. Deliver me from blood guilt, guiltness, O God. O God of my salvation. And my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. Oh, Lord, open my lips. We need to pray for boldness to open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. Let's give Jesus a praise right now. Let's just let's stand and give him a praise. Let, let heaven see your praises as. Yes, praise Jesus. Let him see you. I love the fact that Stephen remember when Stephen was getting stoned. And he, he looked up and he was able to see Jesus gave him a standing ovation, the standing up because he was dying for the cause of Jesus Christ. Are you willing to die for Jesus Christ today? 
Amen. Okay, where, what verse am I on? Help me. Okay, there it is up there. Oh, no. Oh, I only gave him 13. I'm just keeping on going. Um, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Oh, God, you will not despise. He, there's a reason sometimes we need to be broken. We need to be broken so we can... So we can experience the fullness of God. You know, when you're at your lowest point, that is when, when we, you know, I can remember being at my lowest point before I came to Jesus. And I was on my knees and the only place I had to look was up because I was, I had hit rock bottom. And sometimes if you're a hard head like me, God will bring you to your knees so he can let you look up and see something sweeter, something better than this, than this life has to offer. And I just want to praise God for the day that I met Jesus and, and prayed that that day will always stay fresh and new in my heart and my love for him would grow stronger every day. And I pray for this church that our love for him would grow stronger and stronger every day. So church, I just want to ask you a question. Is there a secret sin in your life right now? A sin that is holding you back from being all that God called you to be because and, and that sin could be ver various things. It could be pride. It could be, it could be one of many things. But, but the Holy Spirit is speaking to you now what that sin may be. And I just want you to realize that you do not have to live another day in that sin. Because you have been set free by Jesus Christ. Because what did he say? The truth will set you free. And I just want today we are going to go through a cleansing process to, to allow us to, to meet Jesus. Because, you know, there's no way we could ever enter into the presence of God or the holiness of God or heaven apart from being the, the shed blood of Jesus and, and, and realizing that we are forgiven. We are forgiven, and therefore we can have access, 24-7 access to the throne of grace to meet him every day. Amen? Okay, we're going to show a video. The story about the pastor and his wife, I, I can't imagine, man, I've dealt with this one, not with Pam, another level before, and this very thing happened to me where my wife came back and told me she was pregnant with another man's son. Or daughter, that no, was a daughter. I'm sorry, another big, and uh, I just can't imagine. You know, that just um, actually brought me to Jesus. It was a reminder of why I came to Jesus because I couldn't handle the pain of what my wife did, but. The worst thing in my life wound up being the best thing because I found Jesus through that. Amen. Oh, man, it's amazing how 30, uh, that was 30 back in 86. I mean, what's that, 32 years ago, and it just kind of flooded me. But anyway, um, sorry, I didn't plan on doing this. Uh, I came up here to introduce Frank, not to do this, but... Um, I uh, just want to, first of all, thank you all for coming to the, today, and I uh, want to introduce Frank, and also I want us to, uh, let, let's give Frank a warm welcome. <laughs> and uh, I want to lift, I want us to lift you up in prayer. Let, let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer on Frank's behalf. Father God, we just humbly come before your throne of grace, Lord thanking you and praising you. You are an awesome God. Lord, you, words can't even describe you, Lord, so I'm not going to try to do that. But Lord, I just want to thank you for what you're doing in Frank's life. Thank you for the time we had last night to share. Um, Lord, you know what's going on in both our hearts. Lord, I want to lift up Frank to you, Lord, and, and pray that you just uh, surround him with the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord, that you would protect him against the attacks of Satan. Lord, that you would allow him to experience your full joy, Lord. And Lord, we know that 
your strength is found in the joy of the Lord. So, Lord, just fill him with your joy today, Lord. And, Lord, as he speaks, Lord, you must increase and he must decrease, Lord. Let him speak. Loose his tongue as if you were speaking, Jesus. Just let your Holy Spirit take control of this service, Lord. And we just want to say we love you and, and just pray that you are just uh, are, are, are welcome here and just blessed through this service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I love being with you guys. Amen. Amen. But you know what? Um, you may think, what in the world does that have to do with evangelism? In my humble opinion, it has everything to do with evangelism. The reason 9,000 Southern Baptist churches baptized zero last year, out of 45,000 churches, 9,000 preached 52 weeks and didn't see a single soul saved. And we talk about, oh, we keep the faith, but we fail at sharing the faith. And I'm just going to be completely transparent. When I got saved at an independent, King James-only, fundamental Baptist church, it was the best of times and worst of times because they were great at Bible memorization and second to none in soul winning. But then it was almost like a cult-like culture that my best friend stuck a gun in his mouth and committed suicide because it's a spiritual treadmill that you can't win. And what I want you to see with the help of the Holy Spirit, we stepped out by faith and started joining a Southern Baptist church. They had a youth group that was second to none. And I had some of my old school independent folks making fun of us that were backslidden. How are you going to a Southern Baptist church? And I'm going to be honest. When I went and found out Billy Graham was Southern Baptist, I cried thinking I must be on the winning team. And I just say this in love as an ordained Southern Baptist, went to a Southern Baptist college. The interesting thing is I almost cried today that I'm still with the Southern Baptist Convention. And I'm just saying this in love because we don't only not only live up to Jesus' message, we're not even living up to John the Baptist. As an evangelist, I used to hear, well, you guys are great at decisions. Where's the discipleship? But the interesting thing is with disciples, they used to tell us it wasn't a real disciple until we baptized them. I've had now some folks say in our convention, oh, we don't even count that anymore. 9,000 churches baptized zero. Another 18,000 only baptized two people or less. So that means 27,000 of 45,000 people are failing. And guys, I'm just telling you, can I be completely frank with you? I really, really believe it's because of sin in the camp. It's killing us. In the last 90 days, 40% of pastoral staff have been dabbling in pornography. 40% of the pastoral staff, God knows what's happening in the pews. And guys, I'm telling you, we are enjoying our sin in private more than the sun in public. I've heard stories why we don't have revival. I've been told of that because when repentance comes, revival comes. And I've heard horrific stories when people confess that the pastor was having an affair with five different women in the church. And now they're afraid no longer to have revival because your sin will find you out. And my God, we are struggling in the house of God. We went a different direction with the Billy Graham Association. We've been known for proclaiming the gospel, evangelism. But Franklin, right or wrong, as far as what you think about him, he's dead right. And he said that I really believe we're going to make this next video on dealing with sin in the camp. And until we get right with God in private, 
we're not going to be a megaphone for him in public. And you know what? I heard of, a, a, I preached at a 2,000 seat tent just three months ago in Alabama. And the director of missions there is now the evangelism chair for the entire Alabama Baptist Convention. He said just recently, he told me on the phone two weeks ago before I flew to India, he said, Frank, the Holy Spirit said, show that video before I preach. Satan was saying, don't show the video. And when he got there, he had to ask permission from the senior pastor. Could he show that 18 minute video? The pastor said, hey, we're paying you to get up and preach, not for you to show some Franklin Graham video. And this is a former director of mission, now the evangelism chair for the whole Alabama State Convention. And he said, but just trust me, the Holy Spirit says, I will dishonor God if I don't show this video. The pastor rolled his eyes. They showed the video. Now three people got saved, which is amazing from the video. But 110 <laughs> come up to the altar and weeping and confessing public and private sin. Amen. He said "Then when he got up to preach Sunday night, Monday night, Tuesday and Wednesday night, he quoted what I say all along. He said, it was almost like a surfer got on a surfboard and I was riding the wave of God. Revival happened, but it would have never happened if we didn't deal with repentance and getting right, even if it means being raw. Because until you get right, people are going to get left out. Amen? Amen. And I'm, I'm not here to throw lightning at you. I'm here to throw love. But I'm telling you, I really believe if we really want to see revival, one, like she said, you've got to see repentance. And two, my pastor always said most Christians are one sin away from totally living the victorious Christian life. I don't know what your sin is. You don't know what my hang-up is. But I'm telling you this. I am sick and tired of being sick and tired. You know, if you live for the flesh, you're going to be a mediocrity. But if you live by faith, you're going to experience ministry. And see, sin destroys, but salvation restores Sin, like the airplane, will keep you grounded. But when you confess your sins, you will fly to heights like you've never experienced. God doesn't want you to be grounded. But when you get grace, you will be liberated and lift higher and higher and higher. And I just want to share this. The reason we are not sharing the faith, because sin is like oil and water. They don't mix. And you cannot give away what you don't have. And until we get freedom and restoration from God, we're not going to be able to effectively share the gospel with others. Amen? Amen? So I'm just going to ask with heads bowed and eyes closed. I'm not going to ask anyone to come forward today. But I'm just going to ask, draw an imaginary circle around yourself. I believe in leaving no child behind, but it's not the person behind you, beside you, ahead of you. Right now, it's just you and a holy God. And I'm just going to ask what Franklin closed with in that prayer. We heard a story about a pastor who was struggling with pornography. We heard about a pastor's wife that has a three-week affair, basically, with a living missionary. I mean, when you think it can't get crazy, it gets crazy. But there is freedom if we ask for forgiveness. No more games. With heads bowed and eyes closed, if you're here today and not 100% sure you're going to heaven, just whisper this prayer. Jesus said, today is the day of salvation. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I'm asking you right now, if you want to confess your sin and ask Jesus to save your soul, just whisper this prayer with heads bowed and eyes closed. Whisper this, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. You're the Savior. I heard my whole life that Jesus died for the world. I realized today in Glen Burnie, if it was just me, Christ would have died for me. His blood, his rich red blood, cleanses my dark, dirty sin and can make it as new as white fallen snow. Oh God, I deserve hell, but the sacrifice on the cross and the bodily resurrection, by faith and grace, I can somehow get heaven. Forgive me of my sins. Give me a new life. I want you to have the keys to my life. You drive from now on. I've lived for the world. Today, I'm going to live for the Lord. Thank you for saving my soul. Thank you, by faith, my name is in the book of life. Thank you that I'm going to heaven. Not because I'm so good, but because Jesus is so God. Thank you for saving my soul in Jesus' name. With no one looking, if you prayed that prayer, young or old, black or white, rich or poor, if you prayed that prayer a minute with no one looking at the count of three, just raise your hands towards heaven. One, two.
two, three. Did I do? Praise God. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Eleven people. Praise God. With heads bowed and eyes closed, question number two. If you're here today and you're a Christian, I don't need to know what it is. But there's a sin that so easily besets us. I'm telling you, if you're an eight-cylinder car, you're not on all cylinders. If you've compromised and you're rolling on only four. There's nothing wrong with a Honda Civic with four cylinders. But if God called you to be a Corvette, you're failing yourself and failing others and failing God. If you're not on all cylinders for his glory. That's not arrogant. That's just accurate. Are you rolling on all cylinders? If there's a private sin in your life right now, with no one looking, I'm not here to embarrass or destroy or hurt. But until we get right, a lot of people will be left out, mostly even yourself. God wants us to have the victorious life. And you can't have a foot in the world and a foot with the Lord and be on all cylinders. With heads bowed and eyes closed, if there's a private sin right now on your radar, and you know it's holding you back, no one's looking. Right now, would you just raise your hand and say, Frank, I want to give that private sin to God. Raise your hand. Praise the Lord. Anybody else have a private sin? Thank you for being honest. Half the room. Praise the Lord. Is there anybody else? Praise the Lord. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus that you're a good God. You're a gracious God. You're a forgiving God. Thank you, Father, that you're willing to throw our sins to the bottom of the ocean. As Corey Ten Boom said, and put up a no fishing sign to remember them no more. God, right now, I pray that this church would think that we're sitting in the front seat of a car. We see a rear view mirror and we see a windshield. And right now, this sermon's for everybody. The reason the rear view mirror is smaller than the windshield is because where we're going with God is more importantly than where we've been in private sin. Oh God, the past is just that, the past. I pray that you would help us move forward by faith and freedom because of forgiveness like never before. God, we're going to be on all cylinders after today. No turning back. No turning back. Thank you for your grace. Satan gives guilt, but Jesus gives grace. In Jesus' name we all said, amen. Man, God is in this place. Can we give God a round of applause? Amen. Number one, praise the Lord. We talked about secret sin, but number two, I want to talk to you about the seriousness of the stakes. I'm not talking about stakes that Outback or Ruth Chris. Can I get an amen? amen. I'm talking about the stakes, S-T-A-K-E-S. -E the stakes are high. Johnny Hunt said there is a high cost to low living. I'll say it again. There is a high cost to low living. Tim Lee said, you can pick your sin, but you don't get to pick the consequence. You can give what you want, but you may lose out on what God had. And I want to encourage you with the help of the Holy Spirit. Right now, we're going to show a two-minute clip from Jensen Franklin, a pastor of Free Chapel in Gainesville, Georgia, in California. And it's a two-minute clip, but it may be the most powerful 120 seconds you see this week. We're going to show this. God is not just dying to save you, Glenn Burney. He's dying to use you. Amen. And uh, we'll show that right now. Thank you. Okay, well, man, amen. Well, you know what? Let me just quote this real quick. It's been said that the only person God can't use is the person full of himself. And I think what Pastor Jensen was trying to say, Johnny Hunt used to always say this. He went to Gardner Webb. I went to Garden Webb. He spoke at my school in 94. Man, he said, a black guy preaches good when he's happy. A white guy preaches good when he's mad. He said, if you're Indian, you preach good all the time. Can I get an amen? He's Indian. But anyways... He said over and over, if you stay close and stay clean, God will use you. And I just want to tell you more than ever, what is confusing to a lost world is when they see us sing his praises Sunday, but we act like the devil on Monday. How many times have I seen people on Facebook, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, they're bragging about Jesus. And then I go back and look at their posts Thursday and Friday, and they're saying crude stuff. They're borderline cursing. And they're posting stuff that looks nothing like Jesus. And guys, we have to be consistent when we walk with Christ. Because you can't turn it on or off. Amen. Because you've learned since second grade, you're the, maybe the only Christ that someone meets. You may be the only church that someone ever attends. You may be the only Bible someone reads. There's five Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. What's the Gospel according to you? And if you believe it, we have to be living it. Amen? Amen. 
So more than ever, a lot of times people think God just uses the pastor, the secretary, the youth pastor, and maybe a deacon. But you know what? If you're saved, you're in the ministry. And this is what I want you to see. I really believe true leadership is caught more than it's taught. So when we talk about secret sin and the seriousness of the stakes, I want you to remember what's at stake. Souls are at stake. I really believe in a time of fasting, for what it's worth, I've lost 35 pounds since Thanksgiving. I need to fast some more, but hey, at least we're going backwards, amen? I was so skinny. I was 6'1". I weighed 156 pounds, 4% body fat. The day I got my high school diploma, I was on three basketball teams. I could slide through a Cheerio back then. <laughs> but all those years traveling, the planes got smaller. I got bigger. I was on Fox News in New York. I don't know what I was thinking. I wore purple that day. And when it came off, I said to the producer, and I said, what did you think? They said, man, you're amazing. You look like Barney, but you're amazing. Are you? <laughs> So I don't wear purple when I'm on TV anymore. But this is what I want you to see. Is guys, I'm telling you, I think we have been saved so long as Christians. We've been saved so long. We forgot what it was like to be lost. Number two, most of us have enough of Jesus to get us to heaven. But we don't have enough of Jesus to keep a best friend out of hell. And we're good at keeping the faith, but we fail at sharing the faith. I've told people I never felt smart growing up, but I cried the day the Bible said I could be wise. He that wins souls is wise. And someone asked Billy Graham, how many people have you saved? And he said, none. Jesus saves. I just sow, sow the seed. And you know, some of us preach, some of us teach, but we each can reach. Um, I listen to a lot of podcasts. Most of the time in preaching circles, it is rare when I hear a great sermon on heaven. I look forward to heaven. Amen. Amen. If you think that this is the absolute best that will ever be, you don't have much faith in God. Jesus made the whole world in less than a week. 2,000 years later, the carpenter from Galilee said, I go to prepare a place for you. In my father's house as many mansions. If he did all this in seven days, my God, what is the heaven going to look like 2,000 plus years later? And you know what? What we worship down here, we're going to walk on up there. The streets of gold, the gates of pearl, the celestial sea. It's going to be exciting. But I used to think... If I get to heaven and there's none of that but Jesus sitting in an old school elementary school chair with a little triangle in it, if I get to heaven and it's all it is, is Jesus sitting there, there's no gates of pearl, there's no streets of gold, there's no mansions made by the master. If it's just Jesus in the chair, it will still be heaven to me. Amen. I preached twice at events with Casting Crowns. I was in the green room with Mark Hall one time and I said, Mark, where does the name Casting Crowns come from? When we stand before Jesus, we're going to cast our crowns at his feet. And you can't give away more than God's still willing to give back. Now, like group of the year, six times out of seven, you promote the Lord, the Lord will promote you. But what I want you to see is that more than ever, I get excited about heaven. But you know what keeps me going? When my feet hit the floor every single morning, this has been going on for years. I don't dwell on earth. This may surprise some of you. I hardly think about earth. What I can only get out of my head is there's a heaven and there's a hell. And I've learned when I'm consumed about getting people to heaven and trying to point people out of hell, I've found that earth takes care of itself. But the folks who are just walking around trying to get everything they can get on earth, no wonder they don't lead anybody to Christ. And you know, the interesting thing is, I want to share this with you. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 through 3. Hebrews chapter 12, 1 through 3. I remember, I've now done 153 weddings since 1998. And the interesting thing is, um, I heard this story on a honeymoon couple. Bless you, they got in a fight over whose job it was to make coffee in the morning. You may have heard this story. This is on the honeymoon. So we go from marrying them I almost buried him because she was talking about divorce court on honeymoon weekend. And you've heard this story, but it's wild. The wild thing is they get in a fight and she rolls out of bed and she says to her new husband, baby, get up, make the coffee. And he rolled his eyes and if looks could kill, he murdered his brand new wife and said, oh no, 
you're going to get up and make the coffee. And she said, well, in my daddy's house, he made the coffee. And he said, well, take another look. This ain't your daddy's house and I'm not your daddy. Can I get an amen? She got mad. She goes, well, let's look in the word of God and see whose job it is. And he's rolling his eyes like, how are we going to find whose job it is to go to Starbucks? So he goes to the right. You go to the left. 15 minutes later, she comes back with a big smile. I told you, it is your job to make the coffee. And he rolled his eyes. How can you do that? And she said, well, the 13th book in the Bible says Hebrews. Can I get an amen? So if you have your Bible, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. Let me tell you another quick joke. I, my brother is a caddy in Las Vegas at a golf course. He's caddied Bill Clinton and George W. Bush and uh, Justin Timberlake and Michael Jordan. He's been with all of these guys. My brother makes more money in tips than I do in love offerings. True story. He's making a killing being a caddy in Vegas. It's the fourth most expensive golf course in America. It's $800 to play a round of golf. He said there's two types of wealthy people. Those who will tip you just as much as what they paid or some will actually have the audacity and arrogance to be like, you're lucky I let you carry my clubs. They can be very stingy. The reason presidents love to play golf, it's not because they're any good. Gerald Ford was the only All-American we had, and that dude kept falling down Air Force One. Some of you will get it, but that's good preaching. But watch this. It's not because they're all great athletes. It's because they're buying four hours of freedom. They call the White House the greatest penitentiary in the government system. It looks lovely, but it's lonely. That's why you have to pray for those in authority. I've been blessed now at 46. I've been in the room with seven U.S. presidents. Tom Hanks could have played me. I was Forrest Gump before Forrest Gump. My daddy protected six of them. But watch this. What I want you to see is when I'm talking about Hebrews chapter 12 and this golf thing, there was this guy, loved the game of golf, but he couldn't hit the golf ball to save his life. Swung a thousand times, would try to tee it, <laughs> missed the ball. So then he was thinking of Stephen Furtick from Charlotte. He needed a little elevation. It's a church that's doing pretty good on, around the country. He found an anthill that was three times the size of a limit of a PGA golf tee, thinking I can hit the ball now. <laughs> Swung with all his might, missed the ball, but killed 5,000 ants. <laughs> Only one survived. The ant's eyes got real big. He goes, well, man, I need even more help. He goes, well, I found an anthill that's twice the size of the other. Surely I can hit it now. Wow. Missed the ball, whacked out, killed 10,000 ants, and only one ant survived. The two surviving ants out of 15,000, eyes as big as saucers, sweating profusely, veins in their neck, scared to death, heart racing like a Ferrari. The one ant looked at the other ant and said, my God, what was that? The other surviving ant said, I don't know, but if we don't get on the ball, we're going to die. Can I get an Amen. <laughs> Guys, I'm telling you, if we're in baseball terms, if we're not in the bottom of the ninth, we're in the top of the ninth. And I'm telling you, he that wins souls is wise. The Bible says you can get a soul winner's crown. It just floors me how folks can be in full-time ministry and could care less if someone gets saved. Two years ago, I'm back in Alabama. In a town of 6,000, we put up a 2,000-seat tent. 28 local churches came together and the pastor said, do we put out about 300 chairs or 400 chairs? And I said, in a 2000 seat tent? They said, yeah. I said, sir, you better either shrink that tent or you better enlarge your faith. They got me in 10 schools that week and true story, we ran 2000 people a night for six nights in a row. A town of 6,000 under a 2000 seat tent one third of the town was under the tent every single night. 405 people got saved in a town of 6,000. And then we get people to say, well, revivals don't work. No, stick with God and me. It happens everywhere we go. It's not arrogant. But Jesus is not only dying to save, he's dying to use us. And it's not just, someone said, who's the next Billy Graham? Do you know who it is? It's not going to be one person. If you're saved, he's going to use you. If you allow sin to get out of the way, and if you'll say, here am I, send me, God is going to use you for his glory. Amen? Amen. Oh, Preach it. Yeah, I was going to speak on Isaiah chapter uh, 5 this morning. I think King Uzziah said, high and lifted up. And his robe filled the whole temp temple. And the thing is, that, that's a good point, because watch this. When he saw how high that God was lifted up, he saw the holiness. The angels only know one song in heaven. Holy, holy, holy. Muhammad, Confucius, and Buddha and good works are not holy. God alone is holy. 
And we need to look up and see how holy he is. And then when we look in to see how wretched we really are, until we look up and see how holy he is and look in to see how sinful we are, we'll never be able to look out with the lenses of the Lord to want to reach the loss for him before time runs out. So we need to look up, we need to look in, we need to look out. And then he said, woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips. But once you confess, woe is me, then you get to go for God's glory. But guys, I'm telling you, and this is why I love revivals and I love Pastor Paul. Pastors by nature, they're calling as shepherds. But if we're not careful, we're so busy looking inward. And then you bring in an evangelist who's thinking outward. But when the pastor and evangelist works together like today, they're no longer working inward, outward. We're finally going forward. There's two oars that row God's boat, evangelism and discipleship. But the Western church in America is content with one oar in the water, wondering why we're going in circles. Two-thirds of God's name is go. The first two letters of gospel is go. Good news is go. And he said, go, but we're satisfied sitting on the sidelines. Hebrews 12, 1 through 3, seeing we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race set before us. Christianity is not a sprint, it's a marathon. Verse 2, the three most important words in all the Bible, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that set before us endured the cross, despised the shame, and is currently sitting at the right hand of the Father. Skip down to three, consider him lest you faint and grow weary. And guys, more than ever, I want to encourage you, when I wake up every morning, there is a crowd in the cloud that's watching your every move. Seeing we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Are you ready for this? There is a crowd above watching your every move. And in that crowd is the Savior and the saints looking down on you. And they're not criticizing you they're not critiquing you, they're not condemning you, and they're certainly not cursing you. They're pushing for you, they're pulling for you, and they're praying for you. I love that old Ray Bolsa. Heaven is counting on you. Run with the heart that is true. Carry the cross, reach the lost, because heaven is counting on you. I want to give a shout out to Danielle, who was at the hospital. Where's Danielle? Um, I feel like Ray Charles without my glasses. Amen. I, yeah, I'm at, where, where, where did I say I was? You said hospital. hospital. I'm sorry. That's a whole nother sermon. I was at the hotel last night. Y'all put me up at that nice hotel. I'm there and I see this smiling voice and there's this uh, man and woman side by side and, she's, and I'm behind them in line to check in. And, and she says, uh, well, we have like this olive tree to the right. There's this Papa's restaurant to the left. And there's this guy named Frank Shelton that's speaking at my church tomorrow. We'd love to have you come. And I'm thinking, this girl got it, amen? And the funny thing is, they didn't know who I was because I'm right behind them, but she's a walking billboard. And I'm thinking to myself, I was going to go up, yeah, the guy's crazy, but I'm sure they'd love to have you. But the thing is, is, but that's the thing. They don't need to know who I am. They just need to know that God loves them, amen? amen? And thank you. I love that verse. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it for God's glory. Some preach, some teach, we all reach. But here's the three things I want you to see. There's a crowd above. Say crowd above. And there's the Savior and the saints watching your every move. That may overwhelm you, but that's the gospel truth. Heaven is watching you. I pray you'll never go through life the same. You have a purpose. Raise your right hand. Repeat after me. You are now deputized to evangelize. <laughs> you all are now marshals. Now you can put your hands down. There's a crowd above the Savior and the saints, amen? But there's not only a crowd above watching your every move as you go to work tomorrow and go to school or go to Walmart. And the reason I shop at Walmart, because when you live for Jesus, Target is on your back. Can I get an amen? <laughs> there is a crowd above watching your every move, but there's not only a crowd above, there's a crowd beside. Say crowd beside. The crowd above is heaven watching your every move, but the crowd beside is all of earth is watching your every move. In heaven, the people looking down on you is the Savior and the saints 
but the people beside you, and some of you are just realizing it now, there are the saved watching your every move, and there are the sinners watching your every move. And we cannot, I heard a guy tell me years ago, if you're a Christian, you have a right to be arrogant. Ain't. That is not true. Jesus was never arrogant. He was confident, but he wasn't arrogant. And we can't strut around like we're something special because we are saved. The difference is we've been forgiven. Amen? Amen. And what I want you to see is there's the saved watching us and the sinners watching us. And that's why I said if you believe it, you have to be living it. We can't have one foot in the world and one foot like the Lord. We can't speak truth Sunday and act like the devil on Monday. We can't mix oil and water. You're all in or you're all out. Amen? Amen. And to really get excited about evangelism, you just have to know, one, you're forgiven. Two, you want to be as clean as possible. And three, you can be used by God, just like the pizza box. But there's not only a crowd above watching your every move. There's not only a crowd beside watching your every move. There's a crowd below watching your every move. In heaven, the Savior and the saints are looking down on you today. Again, not criticizing you, they're pushing for you. There's a crowd beside on earth, there's the saved and the sinner. But God gave me this message. If I could rip off the carpet today, break off the concrete, I think it was Vance Havner said, if you could get 60 seconds glimpse of hell, you would never walk the Christian life the same again. Most of us don't even think hell exists, and that's the Christian camp. You know, I told Pastor Paul at dinner last night, when I was a kid, we used to have car beams flash high beams, even in broad daylight, to notify you that radar is around the corner. Do you remember that? We don't even do that hardly anymore. Do you know how we act today? And these are Christians. You know that they've got three Smokies and state troopers on the side. You don't warn them in your heart. You're like, and I hope they get the ticket. And then they fly by you. Woo! Kmart pulls you over and they get not only points, but maybe a fine. That is crazy. And you know what? What we tell people, do, let me give you some other statistics. 90% of born and green Christians have never once led anybody to Jesus. And what we're basically telling us, praise God, I'm going to heaven, but the rest of you are on your own. And we hide behind the theology, oh, the sovereignty of God. If God wants them saved, it's going to happen. No. The greatest evangelist is not a gram, it's the ghost, the Holy Ghost. But watch this. Billy Graham would have never left his home for 80 years if he didn't think he had a part to play in the whole thing. All glory to God, but I'm telling you, when we get to heaven, the reward is going to be through the roof for what God's done through him. All glory to him, like casting crowns, we throw it at his feet. But I'm telling you, I've done 153 weddings. I've done just as many funerals since 1998. I've ridden up in the hearse more than I want to. And watch this. I've never seen a U-Haul behind us following the casket. And that tells me we can't take our possessions to heaven, but I can take some people to heaven. I can't take my stuff to heaven, but I can take some souls to heaven. And I believe heaven is a place you don't show up alone. I've had people tell me that they think hell is going to be the greatest party of all time. They think it's going to be beach, beaches and bikers and babes and bikinis and Budweiser beer. Number one, once you know the king of kings, you don't need the king of beers. Can I get an amen? Amen. Number two is hell is not going to be the greatest party of all time. That is a lie from hell. The greatest party of all time is heaven. And down south, they say, friends, don't let friends drive a Ford. My friends say, friends, don't let friends drive a Chevy. I say, friends, don't let friends miss Jesus. Amen. Watch this. Um, there's a crowd above, a crowd beside, a crowd below. The crowd in the cloud, seeing we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. There's a crowd in heaven. There's a crowd on earth. There's a crowd in hell. Above, the Savior and the saints. Beside, the saved and the sinners. But below, Satan and the separated are watching your every move. God gave me this message on hell. I was on Fox another time, not trying to throw a preacher under the bus. Billy Graham taught us you never get ahead by throwing a pastor under the bus. But there was a guy who wrote a New York Times bestseller called Love Wins, and his synopsis was that everybody goes to heaven when they die. And the chief religion contributor asked me from Fox News, Frank Shelton, do you believe in that? And I said, I'll give you two words, hell no. Not everybody goes to heaven when they die. Jesus preached nine times more on hell than he did on heaven. That's a biblical fact. The Bible says it's a wailing and weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's a bottomless pit. They interviewed four kids, an Asian, an African-American, and two little white kids. Two boys, two girls. They said, 
what are you afraid of? First and second graders, the first one said, I'm afraid of the dark. One of them said, I'm afraid of fire. One little kid said, smiling, I'm afraid of falling. And the other one said, with no teeth, I'm afraid of snakes. And you know, they perfectly painted a portrait exactly what the Bible says hell is. Out of the mouth of babes. Give it to me again. They said, well, I'm afraid of fire. <laughs> the flames never stop. I've been to Arlington with JFK's eternal flame. One day that will stop. But in hell, it never stops. It's just warming up. Not only a place of fire, it's a place of snakes. I can relate to Harrison Ford. Snakes. I hate snakes. Indiana Jones. But it's a place of total darkness. Should that surprise us? Jesus is the light of the world. And because the Lord is not in hell, it's a place of total darkness. Matthew 7, the wise men built his house upon the rock. But in hell, there's no freedom, there's no foundation, there's no future because there was no forgiveness. And have you ever had a dream at 2 a.m. as a kid and you have this fear of falling? Like I love roller coasters and it goes up 100 feet, 77 miles an hour and you're going down and even roller coasters enthusiasts are praying that the bottom hits out because even if you like the corkscrew and the tunnels and the speed, if, if it doesn't bottom out, you're going to throw up lunch. And you're just like, God, will it just catch one more time? That's for you who like roller coasters. Can you imagine hell? You're not only in darkness, you're falling and it never stops. And the reason it's not going to be party, everyone thinks we're going to be rolling with old friends. There is no fellowship or community in hell. I believe people are going to be screaming so much at the top of their lungs, you won't be able to hear anybody think. And then you're in total darkness and you're in that downward spiral like the plane movie. And then, that's not even counting the heat. And if you could even see a flicker of light, but the Lord's not there, if you could finally see something, what do you see is Satan, the serpent, the snake himself. And if that doesn't give you a heart attack, but here's the catch. I heard a guy preach, and let me give you three quick points. Number one, and then we're going to take a quick break. And I promise you, it's going to be a lot more fun the second time. But I just felt compelled to do this. We had to talk about secret sin. We had to remember the seriousness of the stakes. And we have to remember that souls need to be saved. So I'm going to share this. I tell you, it's going to be a lot of humor. So please don't leave. That's the point. But most churches today are not preaching hell anymore. I wish to God I could preach someone else. I, I love to preach anything, but, but there's a time to preach the full gospel. You have to mention a heaven and you have to mention hell, at least on occasion. Amen? Amen. Number one, there's three things about hell. Number one, once you get in, you don't get out. My sister works for a law firm. You know, there's no, I at one time said in Tampa, Florida, I don't know what I was thinking. I was trying to say there's no firemen in hell, there's no EMT in hell. I said there'll be no lawyers in hell, and I said, that's not true. Can I get an amen? <laughs> what I was trying to say is, you could have a million-dollar retainer, but it ain't going to do you no good. But without the grace of God, I'm going to floor some people's theology. There's going to be a lot of preachers in hell. It's not by what we do. It wasn't the title. It was our testimony. Oh, God, we casted out demons, and we spoke to 100,000. I never knew you think are the saddest words in all the Bible. You can quote God, but does God know you? You will remember the times that someone invited you to church and you thought it was a joke. You will remember the times you had a chance to repent and get right with God and you thought I'd catch up with God. It's been said those who wait till the 11th hour to get right with God die a quarter to 11. You'll not only remember the times, you'll be reachless and trapped. I remember I've only missed two planes in 25 years traveling the country. One of them, I was leaving out of BWI. I was only three miles away from Thurgood Marshall Airport. I had 45 minutes to get there. It's in the bag. And then I come to a screech and stop. And it took me two hours to go the last three miles. I missed my plane. And I get there. And the reason everyone's rubbernecking, there is a car upside down. I saw what they call the jaws of life. And they're extracting this one body that I, when they put the sheet on them, I knew that they were dead. And I felt like the Holy Spirit said, Frank, going to Iowa this week and preaching at that outdoor Christian festival, preach the gospel clearer than ever before and warn them of hell like never before. Because in my spirit, I had no idea where that guy was going, but I've read the whole Bible and purgatory is not an option. You're either in or you're out. And the interesting thing is, is um, in hell, there's no jaws of life. There's no EMT. There's no rescue squad. I never thought I'd live to be the day 
that police would be considered the enemy. Now, we have a few Fruit Loops, but just like one teacher does something inappropriate doesn't mean the whole Board of Education is bad. And one police officer does something bad doesn't mean all the long line of blue are a bunch of hooligans. And this is what I want you to see, is that in hell, I don't believe in luck, but because I know the Lord, if you go home today and your house is on fire, if you're fortunate, someone will call the fire. If you're in a two-story house, someone will put up a hook and ladder. And if you're fortunate, someone may be able to pull out some of your loved ones. And an accident, they may call the jaws of life. And if you're fortunate, you may get a second chance. If someone has a chance to hit you on the chest and try to shock you back to life, if you're fortunate, you may get a second chance. But watch me and hear me, please. In hell, there is no extra innings. There's no second chances. There's no overtime. There is no fire truck. There's no EMT. There's no firemen. There's no first responders. There's no cops because there's no hope in hell. You know, the first responder of all time was Jesus, and he's been on a rescue mission ever since. And a lot of church circles are talking about being on mission, on mission, on mission. And the Grahams and us have always thought, but if you're on mission and don't share the Great Commission, you're out of commission. We're preaching today a social gospel, and we preach a prosperity gospel, and we're preaching everything but the sincere gospel. Oh, but we're content whether people get saved or not. I like what Rick Warren said. Our success is not in our seating capacity, it's in our sending capacity. And Spurgeon said it best. He goes, yeah, I preach to 5,000 every Sunday in England, but all 5,000 of my members preach Monday through Friday by the way they walk and the way they talk. And I really believe God is going to use this church and this community to rock this county. I'm not just saying that. I really believe. Now watch this. You guys have been on the church of a move for a long time. You have some powerful pieces in place. Whatever your hand finds to do. You guys have media people. You have IT people. You have accounting people. You have a lot of different gifts in here. You're like an octopus for God's glory and we each have a different talent. But when we're all using our gifts for God's glory in the real world, people are going to see what you have. Amen? Amen? So not only will you remember the times, last point in the intermission, not only will you be reachless and trapped, this may be the most powerful thing as we break. Tony Nolan said you'll be a recipient of torment. Tony Nolan was high on drugs and uh, got saved in Jacksonville, Florida. God called him to preach, and he became the youth pastor at First Baptist Jacksonville. His first pastor was a guy named Dr. Jerry Vines, former president of the Southern Baptist Convention. God began to use him. His second church, he goes to First Baptist Woodstock. His second pastor and mentor is a guy named Johnny Hunt. His two first churches are two former Southern Baptist presidents. Not bad for mentors. Tony said, Frank, there was this kid that I saw a thousand times. He goes, we were running a thousand in the youth group at Jacksonville. He said that there was this one kid about 18, he always walked with his pants halfway down his back, had his hat on backwards. Not that that's a sin. But if you don't know the Lord, anything's in their mind is good. He asked this guy a hundred times, and when now I'm talking, now that we're clean, now that we're forgiven, now that we're repent, we're going to see revival. Now we're ready. Amen? But I want to hear you that every time I share the gospel doesn't mean everybody gets saved. I think I may encourage you by telling you there's people even this week I tell them in love about Jesus. Some will say yes, some will say no. I used to think everybody I met, I had to lead them to Jesus until God reminded me his word. There was people that met Jesus and didn't even get saved by Jesus. And here's the thing, it became liberating when I realized that my, God, my job is to just share in love. It's God's job to save them. But it doesn't mean, I've seen some people preach some amazing 40-minute sermons, look at their watch, well, it's 12 o'clock, see you next week. There may have been 13 people who was ready to get saved. That's wrong. Now, here's the thing. I really believe ministry minus urgency equals catastrophe. If you always do what you always did, you'll always get what you always got. And I really believe, Pastor Paul, God is using you in these last days. I believe even in our wonderful Maryland, Delaware Baptist Convention, all 600 plus churches, I really believe some of them are going to be looking at today what you guys are doing. I mean, who would scratch a Sunday service and think, oh, we can't do that. But I'm telling you, Jesus is bigger than the Baptist box and he's bigger than three points in a poem. 
Amen? Amen. And what you catch today will catch fire tomorrow. Amen. So anyways, Tony said he would go up to this guy and said, hey, would you like to come to the youth group? We would be honored to have you. He'd roll his eyes and said, man, that's for a bunch of losers. He said, no, God is good. He has a plan for you. And he goes, man, maybe one day, but not today. He said, well, we do have some attractive girls. He goes, what time do you meet? <laughs> He said, no, for real, come. He goes, every once in a while, I mean, it's, we just have a great time. We hang out. One night it's bowling, one night it's pizza, but more importantly, it's around the Bible. He said, how can that be any fun? He goes, you've got to give God a chance. I've learned the people who think God is boring don't know God. This book is the greatest book of all time. It is better than Six Flags, Bush Gardens, and King's Dominion. You will have some highs, you will have some lows, but it's everything but a boring ride. Hold on to God. He's holding on to you, and it'll be the ride of your life. You quit coming to church. It's going to be a boring life. Don't forsake the assembling of yourselves. Amen? Amen. Watch as he asked them to come to church, come to church. Not for me, not for me. Ask them a thousand times. I'll ask them a thousand and one. And watch, your theology can be right, but it doesn't give us permission to be a jerk for Jesus. When I hear no, I don't hear no to me. I hear temporarily no to God. They're not telling you no. They're saying God no. But I don't hear N-O. I add a T and a W. I hear not now. A temporary no may be an eternal yes the next time I meet him. All for the glory of God. He asked him no. Tony had just had lunch with his pastor and he gets the call. The guy that he had begged a thousand times is pumping gas in Jacksonville, Florida. His jeans are halfway down his back. He got his hat around. He's pumping gas at a filling station, and I'm not embellishing or exaggeration. Like Andy Cap the cartoon, he's doing the unthinkable. He has a cigarette dangling from his mouth in Jacksonville, Florida. Tony said when the security cam, when it blew, said the truck went five feet off the ground. He said it blew off both bays in the flame, and he said 90% of his body is engulfed in flames. Tony gets to call, just had lunch, to race to the Memorial Hospital, and he's praying, oh God, Help him live long enough for me to get there. He's not ready to meet a holy God. Oh, God, save his soul. Use me, God, to tell him about the gospel one more time. And when he was walking in the hospital, this is a fact. If you know anyone here under the sound of my voice that is married or knows a fireman, this is a true statement. Firefighters will tell you once they smell burnt flesh, it is a putrid smell that they can never get out of their nostrils. And Tony had just had lunch. He's in the hospital. He's praying, oh, God, help him live. And Tony said he had just finished and he's walking in the hospital and he said his words, Frank, I smelled him before I saw him. He turned the corner and he said tubes were all in his mouth. He's laying flat on his back and the boy that was white is a grayish purple black. Chris melted. One of the eyes is almost coming out of his socket in tubes and he's gurgling because there's no air in his lungs and he sees his chest go up and down and he's screaming in pain and skin Flesh is all over the mattress of the hospital. And Tony said, I'm about four feet away from him. I'm trying to show the compassion of a Christ to a guy. It doesn't even look like he's a human. And as he got there, he said, Frank, I literally almost vomited on him about four feet away from the bed. And as he got closer, he was gurgling and saying something. And with the tubes, he was screaming, kill me. And as he got a little bit closer, he said, what are you saying? And he was screaming, kill me. And as he was getting a little bit closer, he goes, I think I hear what you're saying. What are you saying? And he was screaming, kill me. He was screaming, kill me. He was screaming, it is so hot. Get someone to kill me. And Tony said, no, 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 no. You're not ready. You've never trusted Christ as Savior. And he thought it was hot. And true story, I wish I could tell you it was a different ending. He slipped into a devil's hell. And where he thought it was hot on earth, it only gets hotter in hell. And it doesn't stop. And guys, these are things that I cannot get out of my mind. But you know what? I've come to the point that it may not be in the inner circle of everybody on a certain poster. But newsflash, it was never about being seen. It was that the gospel would be heard. And the interesting thing is, is when you get a hold of God and God has a hold of you, you're never the same. And I want to just encourage you like never before. There is a heaven to win and a hell to shun. Can you imagine if you're on a TV show with 60 seconds? Door number one, an all-expense-paid trip to the Bahamas. Yay! 
Door number two, two brand new Honda Accords. Yay. And door number three, we can't promise is what's here, but you can definitely get one and you can definitely get two. But are you willing to risk it for door number three? Well, we should go to the Bahamas. Yeah, but we got two kids. They need cars. So kids and cars and cars and kids and a vacation. And all of a sudden, no, I'm going to risk it for door number three. And you're not going to the Bahamas and you're not getting a car. It's a free trip to hell. Now, can you imagine being the contestant and walking out and thought, man, I'm going to live the rest of my life a loser. I had a chance to win two $28,000 Hondas or an all expense spray trip first class to Nassau, Bahamas. Stay at the Atlanta. Stay in Michael Jackson's resort. Hang out for a full... 14 days, and you're going to have to go back and everyone's going to rib you and tease you and like, man, you loser, you lost. That's just like if you got like a Chia pet, door number three, you know what I mean? <laughs> but the stakes are higher. No, loved ones don't get Chia pets. They don't go on vacation. Loved ones that you and I know, and this is what floors me. Someone cared to share Jesus with you. Are you willing to return the favor? Number two, we know we get to heaven by God's grace, but let me ask you a question and we're done for this segment. If it took you bringing one person to heaven when you died to get in, would you and a friend get in? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this awesome church. We thank you for Paul. We thank you for the leadership. We thank you for our committed lay leaders. We thank you for each person. Oh God, heaven is real. Hell is real. But the joy of the Lord is our strength. I thank you for the gospel. I thank you that we don't got to go to Harvard to be used by you. I thank you that you don't use just the perfect straight A students. You use those who've been beaten up and bruised and battered and broken. I don't know why, but you tend to use the broken people the most. Oh, God, you use imperfect people to promote a perfect God. I don't know why you do, but I'm glad you do. As we take a 10-minute break, I pray that we would come back now that we know we're forgiven and that there's a heaven to win and in hell to warn others of. I pray in the last 30 minutes when we return that we would laugh, that we would see your commission and calling like never before. And I pray that we would see our neighbors and relatives and co-workers and classmates with the love of God. Help us not just keep the faith, but share the faith. Give us divine appointments to invite someone to church, to tell them what Jesus means to us, maybe pay for a lady's pedicure, maybe buy a friend a Starbucks. God, I just pray, however we do it, thank you that you've called us to do it. And Nike's doing it. May we do it. In Jesus' name, we all said. Amen. Take an eight to ten minute break, and I promise you the best remaining minutes is to come. True story. The worst the woman could say is no. You know what I've learned in middle school? It seems like the boys back in the day would be lined up like this, and the girls would be lined up on that wall, and it never failed. It would be the arrogant, obnoxious athlete who's doing all the crazy stuff when no one's looking, and I would know the Christian girl in my Sunday school class and the next thing I know, they're dating. And I remember asking, you know, Lisa, why would you be with him? Not that a holier-than-thou thing, but if your parents saw you dancing with this guy and I already know what he's talking about, what he wants to do after the prom, why would you be with him? And, and I remember her saying, I just got tired of the nice guys not having the guts to invite me out. And you take it back a step. I think that's what lost people are thinking. Christians are on the sidelines when they need to just come up, would you like to learn about Jesus? Amen? Amen? So they called and said, why don't you call them and see if you can give a testimony? And I called up, true story, Robert Shuler's Church, the Crystal Cathedral, the Hour of Power. And I called and I said, is it possible that maybe I could give a testimony one Sunday at your church? I'll pay for my way out there. I get a call back two weeks later. I'm on my couch the phone rings. The caller ID says Crystal Cathedral. My eyes went bang. <laughs> I'm tempted to let it go in the voicemail. God said, no, you better answer it because they may not call back. I answered and said hello. And they said, is this Frank Shelton? I said, yes. They said, this is so-and-so, the secretary to Dr. Robert Schuller at the Crystal Cathedral. And I'm not kidding. She said, do you want to give a testimony or do you want to preach the Sunday sermon? 
I am Baptist, but I turned Pentecostal and I fell off the couch. I said the Sunday school answer. I'm like, well, it would just be an honor to give my testimony. But in my mind, I'm screaming, baby, I want to preach. With the whole world watching, I saw this as a little kid. Well, they said, well, we're going to work it out and we're going to have you on this date. And true story, right before I flew out there, two days before the trip, the Crystal Cathedral calls back. They said, Mr. Shelton, it is nothing personal. But the church has technically been in disarray for a long time. The church is bankrupt and we have now lost it to the California Catholic Diocese has bought ownership of it. There's only two Sundays left and Dr. Schuler is not even on the board anymore. The daughter and the brother got into a fight and the grandson's preaching the last two Sundays and it's nothing against you, but we will not have any guest speakers the last two Sundays. Now in my heart, I was disappointed, but that wasn't supposed to happen to begin with. It's grace. If we ever start thinking God owes me, the only thing God owes me is H-E-L-L. -L. That's the only thing he owes me. Everything else is grace. And Satan was like, well, they owe you and you should go up and just preach or you should have preached and you wanted to see it as a little kid. So I wouldn't even go look at it. But no, ever since I was little, it was built in the 70s. It's this majestic wood on the inside. The pipe organ takes up a block. It's a 3,000 seat place, but it's all state-of-the-art glass and millions would watch it. And the interesting thing is I was like, as I'm flying out there and I was invited to be on Trinity Broadcast Network in Santa Ana, California, while I was out there, and I was thinking I at least want to at least just go in. It's Thursday and Satan's teasing me, don't go, don't go, don't go. And I'm like, I wanted to at least just go in to see it. And I am there and I'm there at five minutes after 4 p.m. California time on a Thursday. And the good news is I didn't know they gave tours back in the day, Monday through Friday from 9 a.m., to 4 p.m., you could get a tour. The good news is they gave tours. The bad news is I was five minutes late. And the last tour had left, and I'm there on the outside looking in at five after four, and I'm so close but so far away. I always would want to have the Windex contract there to clean that whole place, you know what I mean? It would be a pain. Can I get an amen? You know, glad. But anyway, so I'm looking in, and everybody's left, and I'm like, oh, God. And, and I'm, there's a janitor, he's Hispanic. My wife's from El Salvador. So I, I'm looking at this connection and I'm like, I was like a Chinese karate movie, you know, that didn't quite match. And I'm like, well, you open the door when I come in. He goes, it's too late, it's too late, come back tomorrow. And now I'm quoting Stallone from Rocky Three. There is no tomorrow. I got a 6 a.m. flight out of LAX. I want to see it now. Now I'm singing Elvis, it's now or never. But anyway, I'm trying but anyways, the wild thing is I'm on the outside looking in. He says, come back. I'm like, no, sir, please come, please come. And I'm like the woman that kept begging the judge. He knew I wasn't leaving. He comes in and I said, sir, through the glass, can I come in and just look at it for three minutes? He rolls his eyes, unlocks the door, and I step in and I look at this massive cathedral. And I'm looking at it and I never once said, you know, I was really hoping to preach here. I didn't say anything. I'm looking at him and I said, sir, can you tell me, I know the clock is ticking. How long have you been here? He goes, I've been a janitor here for 12 years. And I said, praise the Lord. And I said, um, so what's it been like working for the Schuler family? He looks at his shoes and tears well up in his eyes. And I'm not saying anything out of school or negative or bad, but it really broke me. He said, I've been here for 12 years and they don't even know my name. And I looked at him and I said, well, trying to go to bat for the pastor, I said, well, whew, you know, he, he, I'm sure he's busy. He has like this worldwide ministry. Um, but the Holy Spirit reminded me that we shouldn't be so professional that we lose the personal touch. And I, and I said, can I put my hand on your shoulder and pray with you? And I just laid my hand and I'm not kidding. The man began to shake. He's going into like convulsions and I'm not trying to like you know, it's not Pentecostal or not that that's right or wrong. I'm just saying, I'm, and he's shaking. And I said, the mega pastor may not know your name, but you've told me you're born again. God knows your name and that's all that matters. I said, you've been doing it for him all along. And I just feel like from heaven that God is proud of you. He's now no longer shaking. He's smiling. I spoke life into him and he goes, can I get your cell phone? 
And the interesting thing is there was many times right before I'd get up to preach, I'd be in a hotel, I'm getting ready to get on the platform, I'm backstage, it would never fail. I'd get a call and it would say, Jose, the bottom line janitor, and it would say Crystal Cathedral. I still linked him to Crystal Cathedral even though he was no longer there. And the interesting thing is, and then he would tell me, I'm praying for you. He didn't even know I was getting ready to preach. It's usually a three hour difference. And the janitor is now being used by Jesus to minister to me. Now the Holy Spirit told me when I flew all the way over there from Reagan to LAX, it was all sincere. It was all for the Lord. God didn't have to humble me. I sincerely thought God can do above and beyond all that we ask or think. I can't believe I'm going to speak to 3,000 and they're going to air it the next week to a couple million on the hour of power of Crystal Cathedral. And God said, and you were right and you weren't wrong. But Frankie, you flew over there thinking you were speaking to millions, but I had you fly over to speak to one. And every time I get up to preach, it is still an audience of one. Let me tell you another story real quick. Every time I get ready to do, whether it's been TBN or Fox, it doesn't really matter. It never fails. This has never failed. Sometimes I'm in the passenger seat. Sometimes I'm driving, whether it's Los Angeles, Dallas, New York, Chicago. I know Washington, but I'm usually in a different city. I don't know the ins and outs. And all of a sudden, I'm late to the studio. And Satan says, you're running late. Go hurry up and preach. Do you know Satan would rather have you preach than have you pray or practice what you preach? And he's telling me, you better go to the studio and you're going to speak to this crowd that you're really speaking at a camera, but God knows how many's on the other camera. And I'm always praying and I'm usually prepared and I'm fasting and I'm asking God to use me and it never fails. I'm racing to the studio and the words of smoking the bandit. We have a long ways to go and a short time to get there. And there it is. Every single city, there's a homeless guy with a sign and the Satan is like, keep going to the studio. But God says, circle back. So what happens? I circle back. I put a lot on Facebook, but I'm telling you, don't always let your right hand know what your left hand. We're going to shock a lot of people in heaven. Our greatest stuff nobody knows about. Are you ready for this? Put on your seatbelt. This is just one fun thing. I'll turn back around, throw the car in park, throw the seatbelt. The clock is ticking. You don't want to offend them because they may never have you back. But Jesus said, leave the 99 to go get one. So then I get out of the car and it's like, whoa, I got to jump back. <laughs> Cars are flying by me. I'm remembering what I had for dinner because it was the last supper. Can I get an amen? So then I only got about $10, maybe $20 in my bill. I'm not a prosperity preacher. Amen. I don't even got the money half the time. Sometimes you wonder where the love and the love offering is. But anyways, the wild thing is I'll come up to him and I'll just say something simple. I just want to tell you, God loves you. I want to put my money where my mouth is. I've just, I wish there were a couple zeros behind this. I got a $20 bill, but God told me to give it to you. He's smiling. I'm smiling. I give it to him, get back in the car, throw in the seatbelt, throw it in drive. Now I'm going back to the studio. And the wild thing is I sit down on their velvet couch. They're putting makeup all over me. Three, two, one. And watch this. Then and only then am I ready to speak to millions because I did not neglect individuals Amen. on the way to the studio. Amen. At a Baptist convention a couple years ago, 6,500 senior pastors, friend gets on the elevator, sees the little bellhop pushing the elevator, and just said, been here four days, can I just ask you a question? Yeah. Has anyone out of 6,500 senior pastors this week told you that God loves you? She looked at her feet with tears in her eyes and said, not one. 6,500 Baptist pastors at the national conference, so professional, have lost the personal touch. Johnny Hunt, hero to me, First Baptist Woodstock. My best friend is Johnny Hunt, senior high youth pastor today, Eric Fuller. Johnny and them still do visitation occasionally on Thursday night. The guy running 20,000 in worship still goes door to door on visitation. Leads by example. The deacons one time go to a trailer park a couple miles from Woodstock, knocks on the door and said, we're from First Baptist Woodstock, would you be our guest? And they said, your preacher's already been here. And the deacons are like, the little short Indian, Johnny Hunt, yeah. I don't know if he was a doctor. I don't even know if he was the pastor. He just said, Jesus loves me and my name's Pastor Johnny. The wild thing is, he said, he's already personally come invited me to church. And guys, I'm telling you, he didn't become the president of the Southern Baptist Convention by playing it safe. 
He got up there and lived even off the pulpit that Jesus saves. I see mediocrity everywhere. But if you want to be part of the ministry, you got to be all in. Give God all that you got. Amen? One time I was working at the U.S. Capitol, and um, it was 1993. I had a bag lunch, and I was starving. And I was like, God, I can't wait to go outside and eat. I said, please help it not be raining. And I had a bag lunch. And there's a park on the Russell Senate office building. There's a fountain, and then the dome of the Capitol is behind me. And I come out there with my bag lunch, and I'm starving. I'm like, God, I want to eat. And I come out there. And all of a sudden, the good news is it's not raining. The bad news is there's a homeless man named Harry. He's an African-American, and he's sitting on the bench where I was going to sit. And I approach him, and God said, give him your lunch. And I'm like, Lord, I'm hungry. And the Holy Spirit said, I guarantee you, he's more hungry than you. You can miss this meal, but he probably won't even get a meal tonight. And I believe if you love them, it's easier to lead them to the Lord. So I sat next to Harry, the homeless guy, and... I gave him my lunch and he's happy and he thanked me for the lunch. I told him about the gospel. In true story, he said yes to my lunch, but he said no to Jesus. And my heart dropped. But again, I don't save anybody, but somehow I get to be part of the process. And the worst they can say is no. And when they say no, they're really not saying no to you. They're saying no to God and they're really saying not now. So, but here's the thing. I've had friends who've done drugs and the greatest high is not heroin, it's living for heaven. The greatest high is not snorting crack, it's living for Christ. The greatest high is not being hooked up with marijuana, it's being hooked up to the master. The greatest high is not PCP, it's living for the Prince of Peace. And it's not LSD, it's living for the Lord. And the interesting thing is when you get used by the world, you feel like trash. You get used by God. It's the greatest high in life to be used by the most high God. So the interesting thing is I'm leaving that day. And God said, get smart. Pack two lunches tomorrow. One for you, one for the homeless guy. Now this brother from another mother. Can I get an amen? Harry had me fasting and I wasn't even trying to be spiritual. I was starving. So I go home that night. I pack two lunches. One for me, one for him. I go back to work. I got my suit, I got my little silk tie, I got my cufflinks. They used to call me the junior senator from Maryland. The wild thing is, is I would come in and I'm like, oh God, it's nine o'clock, I'm starving. 10 o'clock, I'm starving. 11 o'clock is lunch. God, help it not rain and help Harry the homeless guy be there. I got a lunch for me and a lunch for him. And I get out there at 11 o'clock and I'm rolling. Woo, can't wait to go eat. Praise God, there's no clouds in the sky. And I get to the Russell Senate Park And the good news is there's Harry, the homeless guy. True story. There's another homeless guy sitting next to him. And God said, give them both your lunch. I said, God, are you trying to kill me? And the interesting thing is I felt like Jesus between two thieves on the cross. I got Harry here and a new homeless guy here. They're both laughing. I'm like dying because I'm kind of hungry. And I'm telling them about God. And true story, Harry said, yes, day number two. The other guy said, thank you, but no thank you to Jesus. But I went home, don't even think my feet hit the ground, to think the God of the universe somehow used me again today. My dad was the assistant chief of the United States Capitol Police. Out of 2,000, my dad was number two, the number two top cop. $783 million annual budget, shy of a billion dollars. He was the top cop, not only for D.C., the nation's country's police department. My family's protected the last 26 of 29 U.S. presidents. Dad protected six. Some of you know my story. My ancestor hand-carried Abraham Lincoln across the street. Good Friday, Fort Slater, 1865. My ancestor carried Lincoln across the street the night he died. On my mom's side, my ancestor hand-planted the cherry blossoms. In 1912 to 1914, that one million people come every April to see what my ancestor planted. He was the head gardener of the U.S. Park Service. He had already put in for his retirement, and everybody even has a boss, even as the chief foreman. And they said to him, my ancestor, we need you to stick around. We just got a gift from Japan, and it's a goodwill gift where you plant this plant. He said, guys, I've done 35 years. I've done my time. I'm done. And he said, no, would you stick around and do it? And true story, in 1912, this is a fact, it was the coldest winter on record in Washington, D.C. in 1912. 
You've heard of whistle while you work. He had a kerosene lamp. One of the colleagues said, it seems so small, those little plants. Who will know if we don't do our job? And you know what's interesting? When my one ancestor carried Lincoln and he's looking down at the six foot four commander in chief, I know he knew what he had in his hands. But some aren't 100% sure if he knew what he had, the gift from Japan. One carried greatness in life, one carried greatness in death, one carried a plant, one carried a president, but they both, I believe, knew what they were carrying. I don't know what was colder, the cold climate of the capital city, the chilling complaints of a colleague, because even they can be cruel and crazy. It seems so small, who will knew? It was so cold with the kerosene. He's not whistle while he worked. He's whispering a private prayer. God, help the seedling stick because they almost were aborted before they started. Took him two years around the tidal basin and my ancestor hand planted the iconic cherry blossoms. It was a gift from Okinawa, Japan. And this is what I want you to see. I tell church planters across the country, the Bible says in Deuteronomy, don't despise small beginnings. Because what looks small blossom in D.C. terms to not only something major, but monumental. And now pulpers to prime ministers to presidents come see what he planted. But this is where it really gets good. My dad had an unmarked police car, and I'm getting to ride home with the chief. And I get in the car after leading Harry the homeless to the Lord and getting striked out here but giving away my two lunch. And when I didn't think the day could get any predator, my dad says, Frank, guess who called today? And I said, Dad, I have no idea. He said, the White House called. The director of the U.S. Secret Service gave one award in 93. Out of the whole country, my dad got the United States Secret Service Leadership Award from the director of the Secret Service. My dad was the chairman of the inaugural committee for Bill Clinton's first inauguration. 600,000 on the... West Front, I sat in the fourth row with my mom and my aunt and my uncle. My dad was in charge of the entire security. Barbara Streisand was 12 rows behind me. I looked at Babs and all I could think of was, how do you like me now, baby? <laughs> but it was my dad who did it. I get in the car with my dad and I said, Frank, I, I'm Frank Jr. I said, so dad, the White House called? I said, what do they want? He said, Frank, it's been six months since I did the security for Bill Clinton. And the president and the vice president is coming to meet with the Speaker of the House and Bob Dole tomorrow. And the president wants to meet my dad in a private room for a photo op six months later to say thank you for all your hard work. And I thought, man, that's so cool. My dad and the most powerful man in the world, regardless of your politics, that is still pretty cool. My dad was a Sunday school teacher, never preached a sermon, but it has been said over and over when I walked the halls of Washington. To this day, they said, your father is arguably the most respected man on Capitol Hill. He was a cop and went all the way to the top. And never forgot what God did. It was God that put him there. So anyways, I thought that would be cool. My dad is so humble. He's the one that worked 18 hours a day, seven days a week for six days straight. When my ancestor, when we lost Lincoln, it wasn't his fault. The guy on Lincoln's door was drunk. My ancestor was two doors down, one of the first to respond to carry Lincoln. But it's amazing. You can carry guilt for something you didn't even have. So dad knew that this president is on his watch, and he's thinking, by God's grace, not on my watch. So when he finally get a chance to catch up again one-on-one -on -one with the president, my dad said, Frank, I could have had this moment in the sun, but no, I want to share it with my son. And he said, I've already cleared you. I want you to meet the president when I'm with him in the morning. Humble, my dad. The crazy thing is I couldn't sleep that night. I was so excited. And Satan says, whatever you do when you shake the president's hand, do not mention Jesus. My name is Bill Clinton. But... <laughs> And all night long, all I could think is, don't talk about Jesus. You may look dad, dad bad, blah, 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 blah. But I knew God did that. And when I finally got a chance to be with the president, I just shook my hand. The vice president was behind him. The speaker of the house was behind him. You never see the three most powerful men in the same picture. You definitely don't see them all three outside. In that picture is my dad, me, and the three most powerful men in the world outside the U.S. Capitol. We have a designated survivor even in the State of the Union address. And here we were... And just to get out the word, God bless you, Mr. President, it was like almost all hell was coming against me. But here's the thing. I didn't chicken out the day before when nobody was watching. And by God's grace, I didn't chicken out when a lot more people were watching. As he was walking into the motorcade with nine-inch bulletproof glass windows, it dawned on me the day before 
I'm sharing Jesus with the poorest people in Washington. Within 24 hours, didn't see it coming, had no clue. I am now sharing Jesus with the most powerful person in Washington. But if you share Jesus when no one's looking, you won't chicken out if everyone's looking. And here's the thing. It was never to be seen. It would be that the gospel would be heard. I never felt smart. But he that wins souls is wise. My dad graduated from the FBI Academy in 1978. And um, they tell me the FBI has a 10 most wanted. And I want to encourage you tonight, right before we do the Q&A, I want you to come up tonight when you get home and write the name of 10 loved ones and put them on your refrigerator. No one else needs to know what it is or maybe even in your bathroom when you brush your teeth. This has worked for me for decades. I still have a list. I've had a lot of lists, but I still have a list of 10 people who need encouragement or need Jesus. And I've learned if you start praying for them, God will strategically start putting them in your path. You will be working. You don't even go to Walmart. And all of a sudden, bam, your first day there, number three and number seven is on your list in the same aisle. You may be, you don't even go shopping at a particular time at night. And there you are. And there they are. And I've learned, an African-American farmer told me years ago, you'll never see a harvest until you learn to water your crops. And then I heard the preacher take it to another level. Have you ever cried yourself to sleep weeping over the souls of lost friends? When you still get a burden, General William Booth, the founder of Salvation Army, they were literally an army of God whose salvation was part of the main focus. We've come a long ways and come off track. Back then, they had an officer for the omnipotent, they had a sergeant for the Savior. They had a lieutenant for the Lord. They had a captain for Christ. And there was a general for God, William Booth. This man could just show up and mention Jesus, and it seemed like they were getting saved left and right. Two of his underlings, sincere, going door to door, without near the effectiveness, and they wrote to the general, how do you do it? And the general, true story, wrote back two words on his letterhead. Try tears. And until they began to get burdened and broke for souls, they never saw the revival. And guys, I just want to challenge you um, to get 10. Um, I'm just going to be, if I can't be real here, we won't be out real there. My dear friend was a stutterer. He said, I feel like Moses. I know I'm supposed to share my faith, so I would chicken out if I had to share. You know what this brother did? He had these chick tracks. Um, this was your life. God gave him an idea. Please don't think I'm disrespectful. My buddy, I thought it was brilliant. He said, the word don't come back void. He said, Frank, I would just get nervous talking to people. I was a stutter. My knees would shock. He said, I'd look like Elvis on the Ed Sullivan show. My tongue would get dry. My palms would get wet. He said, but what I started doing was taking gospel tracks in the bathroom and I would stick them on the urinal <laughs> when nobody was in there. But when guys had to go in and use the bathroom, they started reading about Jesus, and that was his way. Someone, my pastor, when he first started preaching, would go to Dunkin' Donuts. He would have a gospel track. And he said, and this was part of his testimony, true story. He said, I lost four kids to a congenital heart disease. Keith will tell you this is true, Marvin Harris. Lost four kids. I'll say that again. Yeah. yeah. Amen. I forgot. So, the, the, hey, that's good. Amen. So Marvin and Donna Harris lost four kids to a congenital heart disease. And I've been in the car with them many miles watching them do it. He'll tell them at Dunkin' Donuts. And Marvin's bought, Bill Dad, Marvin's bought more Dunkin' Donuts than Dunkin' Donuts. Amen. <laughs> Julie watches. But the wild thing is, um, he would say, I lost four kids to a congenital heart disease. The Lord saved my life. I got in the Bible. It's never been the same. Here's something good to read. And he drives off. When we get to heaven, Billy Graham is up there. I think Marvin Harris is right behind. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so there's a song that I was going to show, but we're not just going to show it for the sake of time. One of my old favorite songs of Michael W. Smith. One of them is an old classic, um, Kentucky Rose. That's one of my all-time favorites. Um, I'll Lead You Home is one of the more recent ones. I like that one, but maybe my all-time favorite Michael W. Smith song that most people don't even know. It's called Seed to Sow. 
And um, basically, the song is basically saying, you have the guys with the bullhorn on the street corner screaming with veins in their neck, right or wrong, Jesus saves. And then you got the meek person who's just one-on-one, just gently telling what God means to them. But it says, no matter what side of the coin you are, there's only one thing I know Everybody has a seed to sow. Ray Bolt sang a song, Heaven is counting on you. Run with the heart that is true. Carry the cross, reach the lost, because heaven is counting on you. Guys, I want to encourage you. Your past is the past. You're forgiven as kids of the king. You have a clean slate. You're moving forward. Remember, there's a heaven, there's a hell. But God wants to use you on earth. And man, can you imagine if we each brought a friend next week? Some of you know my story. But at 10 years old, I was going to a church that ran 33. And in one week, I brought 22 kids to vacation Bible school in one week in 1982. And if God could use me at 10 to bring 22, he can use you to bring one or two next week. And I'm not really smart, but if you each brought one, this is a great crowd today. Well, we double the crowd next Sunday. Now, if you each brought two friends, it's getting excited. You bring three friends, we're in a building program. Are you with me? And remember, the worst they could say is no. I tell people when I do the weddings, um, what about if they say no? Well, unless you're willing to risk and stare at that phone, you remember for those of us who are blessed to have been married and you're looking at the phone and it's like, should I, should I not, should I, should I not? She'll say no, she's really dating another guy. I'm going to look like an idiot. I sit next to her in science class. It's going to be a long semester. I mean, she really does like someone else. I mean, good night. I don't even got nice clothes. I got pimples here. I got acne here. I mean, but here's the thing. Until you risk inviting her out on the first date, Unless you're willing to hear her say no on the date, you don't deserve to hear her say I do at the altar if you get married. You have to be willing to get rejected before you can get accepted. And guys, I'm telling you, the worst they can say is no. And you know what? Confucius, Muhammad, Buddha, these guys are working their way to hell. And I'll never forget when someone said, are you willing to do for the truth what others are already doing for the lie? So when I preached in India, there's a board called the Martyrs Board. And that church, that school, that seminary I preached last week has produced, true story, more martyrs for Jesus than any school in the world. A pastor from Virginia wrote on my Facebook. He said, Frank, most Americans don't have a clue about persecution. And I wrote... From India, I said, you're right. Most Americans that I know struggle with living for the faith. I've met the people who line up to die for their faith. And Billy Graham said, you're not willing to live until you're willing to die. And I took the martyr's oath in Kota, India last week. And it would be the highest honor of my life. Like John the Baptist, not only saying repent, but to lose my life for the Lord. Not hoping to gain my way to heaven because I died. But because he lives, just try not to show up to heaven all by myself. I'm going to ask right now, Pastor Paul and I are going to do a quick Q&A. And uh, maybe you can ask some questions. But here's one last thing as Paul's coming here. I want you to take out a phone. You don't have to do it today. But by the time you get home today, most people have an iPhone. Why don't you just film yourself? Have a friend film yourself and just say, Hi, this is Lisa. Hi, this is Mark. This is Frank. You know, I go to North Glen Church. My pastor is awesome. And you know what? God changed my life. We meet every Sunday at blank, blank, blank. We're the church for imperfect people. We would love to see you as my guest. Private inbox me if you want to come next week. I'd love to pick you up. That's all you got to say. That way, and you put that on Facebook, you're not just putting it on the church page because let's be honest, you're preaching to the choir. But if you put it on your personal Facebook page, I know friends who have about 200 friends on Facebook. They've done what I've told them. They'll get 1,000 views. 
How is that possible? And they only had 200 friends. People start sharing it and sharing it and sharing it. And they go to their friends. Now, if just one person could get 1,000 views, what about if half of you took the fun challenge? You're not preaching at them. You're not going to hell. It's not doom and gloom. It's not turn and burn. It's a smiling face. Would you be my guest at a future Sunday? It's impersonal, but it is personal. It's not preaching to the choir. It's just a saved person trying to share. And the worst they can say is no. You know what I mean? So just have fun with it. Call a friend, visit someone, take them out to coffee, treat their meal, just love on them. Amen? Amen. So I, do you feel like this was worth it? Would you give the Lord a round of applause if you've been blessed? <laughs> Paul, will you come here real quick, buddy? I promise you, <clears throat> we'll be out here real soon. But if you have any questions for Pastor or myself real quick, why don't you just do a lightning rod and ask him a question or two and... If you have a concept or a concern or how would you do this? Anyone? But thank you for thinking out of the box. Amen. 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 Anybody have any questions? Right. Yes, ma'am. How was your trip to Afghanistan? Oh, that's a good question. You're thinking Pakistan. Pakistan. Yeah. Okay. The trip to Pakistan was scheduled in November and Pastor Bill Breon from Emmanuel Church in Wilmington, Delaware was my host. I was invited to speak to a thousand Christians by day and teach them evangelism. And I was scheduled to preach to 10,000 Muslims at night. Mm. Pastor Bill, by the time I shared that with you, had a massive heart attack. The good news is he's back in the pulpit, but he was out for 90 days. And he said, Frank, we lost so much precious time because he was my liaison to pull it off and he wasn't going to go on the trip. So Lord willing, that's the one date on my calendar. Lord willing, it's this November I've been told you don't always tell the enemy where you were until your wheel's up coming home. But I did just preach in Africa on New Year's Eve. And I preached um, at the Nelson Mandela Soccer Stadium. And we had 118,000 people. I got a text this morning from Billy Graham's son-in-law. But Billy Graham's son-in-law texted me when I landed back from Africa. He said, Frank, Franklin Graham's largest crowd last year in Libya was 44,600. He said, your last name ain't even a gram, and you guys tripled the crowd. <laughs> That's what he said. <laughs> so it's all glory to God, but I got a D in public speaking. I said, was that for dynamite? She said, you need a lot of work. God uses idiots. I'm just one of the idiots. Again, it wasn't about the crowds. It was about the Christ. But anyways, um, and then just last week was India. I've been invited to finally preach in my wife's hometown of El Salvador the last week of July and the 1st of August. And then, Lord willing, Pakistan. Um, and then last year, I preached in Bucharest, Romania. And then Paris, France. I flew to Europe twice. We saw Muslims get saved. I just had the honor to lead a husband and wife Mormon to the Lord. So here's a word for someone I didn't say in my notes. The people who look like Jesus the least, deep inside, are open to him the most. I just led an uber Muslim guy to the Lord in Washington, D.C., and they think Christianity is boring. You may find me dead in the back of a taxi, but we went out swinging. Can I get an amen? <laughs> but anyone else? Yes, sir. Yes. You go first. You go first. When? Uh, well... As I share with you at the beginning of the service, when I was on my knees crying, um, when Jesus came to me, it was an experience that I'm starting to think about. It. Thirty-two. When, when I came to Jesus back in July of '86, my whole life changed, and, and there, I believe the fire started that day that that He came to me, and. Um, when I received the Holy Spirit, and I, although I'm far from perfect, and I, I got a lot, lot way, long way to grow, but I do have a fire in my heart for Jesus Christ, okay. and okay. Um, and Jesus knows I have a deep love for Him, and and I, and I have for thir almost 32 years now. So I, um, just coming to Jesus was just, it was a miracle, because I know who I was, mm -hmm. and just. The, the fact that Jesus would would pursue me and come to me probably I would probably be one of them guys that if you get the least likely to succeed I was probably the least likely to ever come to Jesus Amen. and um, so that 
Amen. Yes, yes, you do. Amen. That's awesome. You know what? I mean this all sincerity. Um, when we're done, this guy is my hero. I love your pastor. He's bivocational. I was bivocational for a long time. They always said, if I love God more, I'd be full time. That's, that's just crazy. This guy has done more for God than anybody that I know. Would you give Pastor a loud round of applause? I love you with all my heart. You're the man. Amen. Yeah, real quick, that when I brought 22, um, and I'll, I'll give you the abbreviated version. We had the old phone where you would stick your finger in the roadie phone. I was in my parents' master bedroom, 2660 Pinewood Drive, 1982. And I've ever heard the voice of God, and I'm talking like David Ring said, you mean a, a, a loud voice? And he said, no, much louder than that. <laughs> When your heart is beating and you know it's God. If I've ever heard the voice of God, the Holy Spirit said at 10 and 82, Frankie, there's a heaven and there's a hell. What are you going to do? And I remember thinking, what about if I invite him to church and they think I'm an idiot? What about if they ask me a theological question and I don't know the answer? I'm 46. I still don't know all the answers. But I do know Jesus saves and Jesus loves. And he's the only way to heaven. So the first night, I got three first-time visitors. The second night, I got six first-time visitors. The good news is we had them coming. The bad news is my mom couldn't fit them all in one car. My dad was a lieutenant at the time, working 3 to 11 with the Capitol Police. My dad had just gotten saved, and my mom called. The funny thing is my dad protected Congress, but my mother ran the house. That's a fact. <laughs> and called my dad, a lieutenant at the department, and said, Frank, Frankie got six kids. I can't put them all with seatbelts in my car. She said, you will come back early and drive these kids. My mom used to pack my dad's lunch. Before my dad got saved, she had bread and had lettuce and bologna and bread. And true story, my dad took a bite into it one time and my mother had put a gospel track in my dad's sandwich. <laughs> and my dad went crazy and came home and said, Sharon, you're shoving Christianity down my throat. But she really was dry, but he got saved and my dad and I got baptized the same day. But she said, I'll drive them Tuesday, but you will not ask me Wednesday. Well, the, I had three. Six on Tuesday and Wednesday, I had 11 first-time visitors. Thursday, I had 18, and my mom thought she was causing trouble to call Dr. E.G. Jack. He's running 33 at Brandywine Bible Church, nine of the pastor's family, five was mine, so 14 of 33 was two families. My mom thought that she was offending the pastor. Frankie has 18 kids. My mom said the pastor said, Sharon, the Bible says a child shall lead them. I didn't think it was your kid. He had a CDL license and picked us up in this aqua blue 1972 school bus that said Brandywine Bible. And on Friday, I had 22 first-time visitors. So I just think that's when it hit. But let's face it, Satan told me the lie that I had to be perfect to be used by God or I had to have it all together. And praise God, that's not the case. The worst sinners usually become the best saints. So no one has an excuse not to be used by God. And those who have had a mess you share the message, it will touch the masses. I'm just living proof. Paul is living proof. So I just want to encourage you, but I'll say it again. Billy Graham preached to millions. Some people may preach to thousands. Most of us will preach to a hundred or less. But some of us will never speak to ten. But success is not to millions. To me, success is sharing one at a time. And we each can reach one more. Amen? Amen. 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 God bless you guys. Okay, I guess it's time to yeah. close in prayer or okay. I think we got another one question? One, real wow, great question. Do you want to go or do you, we both go real quick? You go, you go first. That's a great question. It's Thank a great you. question and I think most Christians have experienced that. For me, the question was, if, how do you not become discouraged when family members Amen. refuse to follow? And I believe that we have to put our hope in Jesus Christ, not our family. I, I, I say that because people are going to disappoint us. And the Bible even tells us in the end times that our, even our, 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 our sons and daughters and Parents will turn against each other. Right. In the end times, the heart of many will grow cold. But 
the way what I try to do is just keep my focus, keep my eyes on Jesus, and realize that um, that the people that are not following, it's not because don't take it personal, but it's the fact that they have just they're really rejecting Jesus. They're not rejecting you, and so to keep strong, I just would encourage you what I try to do is I love love on Jesus because we can't force anybody to love us as much as we want to be loved by others honestly you know we have to take that love for Jesus and and pour our, our love into Jesus and, and and keep praying for those that aren't following because we know there's a better way but they're not remember where you were at one time my mom used to just real quick, my mom used to love um, Billy Graham and all the different people she would talk about. And you know what I used to say as a teenager? All they want is your money. You know, I used to always, and that's what the world thinks, and that's where our family thinks sometimes the church is all they want is our money. And I think that's why one of the reasons I rarely talk about money because I don't want to give people an impression that that's why I want you here is because I want your money. Because it's you want to to see them have a relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm sorry for the long answer. No,